In software development, engineers often make five types of code changes. New features, bug fixes, improvements to existing features, refactoring, and some minimal changes like configuration, infrastructure changes, documentation updates. Having corresponding tests for at least four of these changes is crucial for achieving bug-resilient code. You are watching 100GB and welcome to the 8th episode of the Clean Code series which is all about unit testing. And by the way, this series is all about this great book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin and I would recommend you to check out the previous episodes as well in case you haven't already. Alright, what is testing? Testing as we know is an act of making sure that our code behaves in an expected manner in different situations. It can be manual or automated and today we will focus on the automated part of it. Automated testing is all about writing code or writing more code to test the code that you have already written. Let's see what's unit testing. Unit testing in specific means that you are writing tests for a given unit of the code which generally is a class for various object oriented languages or it's a file of code for other languages. There are other type of automated tests as well like one of those is the, the integration tests. Those are where multiple units are tested together but the system boundaries are still faked or mocked. For example, for Instagram, posting a reel with a fake server can be regarded as an integration test. And the next type is end-to-end -end tests. These are the tests that effectively test the entire user journey as if that automated user was a real user. And as an example, for Instagram, posting a new reel with their real server can be regarded as true end-to-end -end test. Now, you might have a question what all tests to write. Apparently, after years of research and experience, organizations have recognized the importance of this testing pyramid, which should be flashing, uh, where unit tests are the biggest in number, followed by the integration tests, and followed by a smaller number of end-to-end -end tests. Okay, not to digress, let's circle back. Let's write a simple unit test and see how it goes. Okay, so we have a very simple calculator class uh, that has a method to add two numbers, subtract, multiply, divide oh, and the division throws an illegal argument exception as well. Let's quickly see uh, how we write tests for this particular class. We first test the add behavior. Uh, we create a new calculator class which is to be tested and then we call the add method with the given numbers. We assert if the result is as expected. Similarly for subtract, multiply, divide, we didn't check the we can possibly add another test as well. So we should possibly add this uh, another test as well, which throws uh, to test the divide by zero case. And in case you have noticed, all these tests follow one same pattern. On the top, we have the arrangement block. In the middle, we have the action block. And at last, we have the assertion block. And you will see this term uh, in your software journey quite a few times. Arrange, act, assert, or given, when, and then, or context, action, and outcome. This is what the structure of every unit test looks like. Okay, let's see why is testing important. First, it removes the fear of a code change. Well, that fear virtually disappears. So without tests, every change is a possible bug and we are very reluctant as engineers to make a code change. I have been in that particular situation for a good four years and I'm not a fan. Well, the blessing in disguise is that the time to production is around like one third when you don't have any testing infrastructure in place and no tests to write. The higher the test coverage, the less is your fear. Very classic example is let's say that PDM is adding a new payment method which involves some changes on the server side. The last thing they want is their existing payment methods stop working because of that particular code change. If they have the right set of tests, they can make sure that the tests pass even with this new code change, which kind of acts as a proxy to the fact that their code change is not causing regression to existing functionality. There are other side benefits as well, like cost saving and forcing compliance and things like that. But those are like all of those are like added benefits. Let's talk about test driven development. This is another term you might come across in your software journey. Uh, let's take a quick example. So you are integrating with the payment gateway on the client side for your app and uh, there is this payment journey where the user enters an amount you call an api on the payment gateway payment gateway gives you an asynchronous response like after a while uh, regarding the status of the payment now hold that thought let's take a look at the three laws for the test driven development the first law you may not write production code until you have written a failing unit test which basically means you write the test first and then you start writing the actual code. 
let's see how it goes in practice. So let's say you were in the same example that I mentioned, you were writing this payment service on the client side, uh, which depends on the payment gateway and the user service. And there is this method called process subscription payment. Before implementing this method, you will of course have some design where you would know what all things to check in this particular method. So what you'll do is you will create a test class and just start writing some basic tests on what you think the functionality would be. The name of the method is process subscription payment. Okay. So let's do subscription payment. The first and obvious is the well, when the payment succeeds. The user might not be there and it can lead to a possible failure. Okay, and a few more cases where the amount that we have uh, sent to the function might be invalid or the user has already paid for the subscription. Even in that case, it should lead to a failure. And that's what this first law says, that you write, at least write the test first and make sure that the tests are failing. Something like this for all the tests. And then you start implementing your function. Let's go to the function. Let's quickly see what this function is doing. The function is getting the logged in user details from the user service. If the uh, user is not present, uh, they have logged out, then we throw an error. If the user has already paid for the current period, we again throw an error. If the amount is invalid, we just fail and throw an error. And if all of this is fine, it's only then we, we call the payment gateway with the amount and the metadata and the callback. And finally, when the results arrive, we call our future result. So this future result can be thought of as a callback mechanism. Not exactly, but for the sake of simplicity, let's go ahead with it. All right, the second law. Uh, it says that you may not write more of a unit test than is sufficient to fail and not compiling is failing. It's very hard to understand, but tricky. I don't know why it's this way. Anyway, but the underlying concept is that you should strive to write focused tests that will fail only if the code being tested is incorrect. No extra assertions should be added that have nothing to do with the like the current test scenario. Let's take a look at the code. So if you see this particular uh, test that I have written, the first line, I'm mocking a call from the user service, then I'm creating an object of the payment service calling the, the subscription method and then asserting if the error is thrown. In theory, I can actually add an assertion. Yeah, in theory, I can actually add an assertion that the payment gateway has not been interacted with, which is actually not required. And in the future, if let's say there is some interaction because of some reason, the test might actually fail, uh, which we maybe don't want. But this is something which is absolutely extra. And that's what the, uh, the law suggests that you shouldn't put this thing and your test should be focused on whatever you were trying to test right now. This particular thing also conveys another concept, which is that you shouldn't test the interactions. You should instead test the behavior. And in some form, I end up testing the interaction here. And by the way, these two are like mocked right now. The third law says you may not write more production code than is sufficient to pass the currently failing test. Well, this law in its essence tells us not to get ahead of the unit tests. We should not add code which is not already tested. And practically, it, it's a bit hard. Uh, but again, the gist is that your uh, code should be covered by the test at any given time. And that is the only major takeaway from these three laws. The tests and the production code are written together and they should be written together uh, all the time. Okay, the next section is keeping tests clean. Okay, why is this important? Dirty tests lead to a dirty production code. The author has a great first-hand story of a team that had dirty tests. The major problem is that the tests should evolve as the production code changes. Now, if the tests are poorly written, engineers will have near to no motivation of updating them. And that's exactly what happened with that team. Slowly and slowly, they got to a stage where they couldn't ensure that making a change in one part of the system doesn't break some other part of the system. And eventually, the number of unintended bugs began to rise, the production code began to rot, and they were left with no tests, bug riddled production code, frustrated customers, and they had this feeling that their entire testing effort has failed them. 
which was maybe not the case. The other thing is that dirty production code leads to dirty tests as well. As we saw that generally unit tests are written along with the primary code and more or less you are directly calling the code that is being tested, which is very evident from the examples that we have taken, uh, which means that if you mess up either of the code, the other is messed up as well. A good example is that let's say you have a public method that takes in what seven or eight arguments, which is pretty bad. You can refer to this episode three for why it's bad. Anyway, you will be calling this method in the test many times, which will clutter the testing code. So what makes a clean test? Three things, readability, readability and readability, which ultimately leads to clarity and simplicity. Let's understand a few aspects of uh, making the test more readable. The first is a dual standard. Well, the author suggests that testing should have different engineering standard than the actual code, which I agree as well. The author goes as far as mentioning a domain specific testing language. That is, we as engineers should have dedicated APIs just for the purpose of writing tests. These can be in the form of like helper methods, util classes, factory methods to create fake or mock instances. Let's take an example in the code. Yeah, so let's try to address this test and create some nice APIs around it. So if you see what I did there, instead of like putting this uh, particular thing manually here, I just created a fake uh, user service using the fake user service factory class and then I call this method set user logged out. Now there are two options either I can create uh, like the service itself can be created for a log out user or maybe it's even better I just create a fake user service and then have some setter methods on the fake service to uh, deduce a particular state that I want and since I want uh, I want a logged out user I did this and then instead of uh, creating the payment service manually, I wrapped it up inside a nice method because I will be using that from multiple tests. And then I call this uh, our action block. And finally, even for the assertion, I wrapped it up inside a nice uh, method that takes in the result and the exception that is expected and the message that is expected. And you just, just take a look at this code. Just take a pause. I mean, it is beautiful. I myself as a reader, uh, uh, my eyebrows will rise and I will be, my heart will be beating when I read this code. I will be like, oh wow, professionals were at play while writing this particular test. Okay, let's get to the second single concept per test or single assertion per test. So the author recommends to just have a single concept per test. What does that mean? Let's take an example of the calculator class and the test that we wrote. So let's say instead of writing these tests, I had this just one test. Yeah, so if you see what I did there, um, I just have one test which tests the entire functionality of the calculator. But I've seen this this kind of test like many times, like throughout the last four or five years. Now, the problem with this code, for one, uh, it's like it's, it's a mental overhead on the reader to figure out which section is trying to do what. When in theory, we can add comments here, addition and subtraction. Well, we know that comments are bad and you can refer to, uh, I guess it was episode four, if I'm not wrong. But instead of adding the uh, comments, why not just move these concepts to the test methods of their own? And the other benefit is that you get a cleaner output in the logs as to what the failure is all about. Because if it fails right now, it'll just point to this particular line that this failed. But if this test fails, it'll say that the test subtract method has failed and you would know that it is the subtraction that has actually failed. Uh, the third one is don't repeat the code or avoid complex calculations. Let's again take this uh, example. Okay, so let's say when in our assertion of the addition, if instead of writing 10, we were doing this or even better if we were doing this. And so it's 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 quite funny. Again, every year I have seen junior engineers making this mistake. Uh, yeah, it happens every year, literally. And not exactly this, but at least the other one where they don't hard code ten and they just 
repeat the code that is being tested which is something that we shouldn't do because we shouldn't do so if we repeat the code it actually means that we are not testing the code at all right so there's a slight mindset shift needed when writing tests where you just need to avoid any computation and actually hard code the expected results if you repeat the code you're not really testing it so just be cautious uh fourth which is behavior driven testing now there are two important parts to it first is that you should always test using public api and the second one is that you should not assert on the internal state and it's instead on the effect or the behavior now without wasting time let's take a look at the code all right so let's say in our um, in our payment service we have these two new internal variables I mean, I'm using this visible for testing, which is effectively private, but these variables are still visible uh, in the tests. Uh, so one is payment in progress, which it looks like it will be true whenever the payment is still happening and we haven't received a response. And the other one is current payment retry count. So maybe in the future, if we add any retry functionality in, the, in this payment service, we might use this to maintain some internal count. And let's say we have a dedicated test for this we call the process payment method uh, and it should be in progress and for this in particular we have this method that creates a payment service that ensures that whenever we call this method the payment remains in, in progress uh, we call the method and then we as a true if the payment is in progress now this is weird why this is weird is it will lead to this particular test being brittle now what is a brittle test? Brittle tests are those which can break very easily. You can think of it like uh, over testing your code. It's a state where you are testing internal methods explicitly and querying the internal state. As a result of which, even if there is like minor improvement in the code that doesn't affect any behavior, your test will fail. Which means that let's say in the uh, in the future, you either remove this payment in progress, let's say you are not maintaining uh, payment in progress internally, but there is no change in the behavior of this process subscription payment method. This test will unnecessarily fail. Uh, so yeah, in other words, I, I think this test shouldn't even be there. But if you still need to add the test, maybe a better method is to assert on the uh, behavior, which is instead of doing this, So instead you can have this where you assert that your future callback has not been called for a certain time period, which will kind of act as a proxy to the fact that the payment is in progress. Another thought on the brittleness. So let's say in the future, if you support parallel payments and you end up making this, let's say an array list, which basically represents payment progress on a per payment basis. Even in that case, your test will like either fail and the developer will have to update this test unnecessarily because there is no change in the public behavior. All right, at last, the author mentions this principle called first. Well, a principle that you can follow to write tests. A test should be fast, independent, repeatable, self-validating and timely. So when we say fast, the test should be super fast. It shouldn't read files, shouldn't communicate with the server. When we say independent, test should do just one thing. When we say repeatable, Test should be consistent. If it is passing, it should pass many times. Uh, it should be self-validating, as in it should have a Boolean output, either pass or fail and nothing in between. Well, there is a state in between. Uh, we call them uh, like assumption failures out of scope, out of the scope of this video. Uh, then the last thing is that they should be timely. In other words, that unit test should be written just before the production code that make them pass. All right, before we close, I would like to mention that unit tests alone are not enough to ensure a bug resilient code. You would eventually need integration tests and simple end to end tests, which are also called smoke tests. And I will leave that part for you to explore. Like and share this video, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye bye.